Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight is the first uh, time for this uh, new time of day, uh, 7 p.m. here in Las Vegas. Uh, it'll be 10 p.m. on the East Coast. Uh, and I hope now with this new time schedule, it'll be real easy to do these daily. And I think this time will work better for uh, all of the people here in the United States. So um, I, I did. The, I'm going to continue with the Bible study tonight on the Book of John. Uh, if you did not see uh, the first episode on the Book of John, uh, I, I covered the first five verses, and so please go back and watch that. That is to me, the first five verses are just so so important to understand. So I hope you will go back and watch that. We're going to pick up with uh, John chapter 1 verse 6 now and go as far as we can in an hour but first of all let me say hi to brother eric and let him say hi to everybody hello everybody it's me again the whole mo d-e-h-a-l-l-m-o okay and that's my channel name as well and uh so far nobody's uh subbed me brother luke <laughs> okay, back to you. No, that's that's very distressing. Uh, I I sure hope everybody who watches these, please subscribe to Brother Eric's channel, and uh, he's been uh, a great encouragement to me and great help participating in these uh, broadcasts. So please subscribe to his channel if you haven't already. Um, all right, I'll read this uh, in the KJV first because I'm what Brother Joe Byron calls a KJV firstist. And then we may look at it also in the Amplified Version, too, if I find it may be helpful. Okay, with verse 6, it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. Verse 6 through verse 14. Hopefully we can go through all that very carefully now. Starting, I'll start with verse 6, and I'll read it one verse at a time, and uh, ask Brother Eric if you'll respond. It says in verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Okay, brother, um, who is this John that was sent from God? Uh, that's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, uh, according to the prophet Isaiah, I believe it was. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and uh, we're, we're referring to later on, we're going to find out that his last name was the Baptist. <laughs> John the Baptist. It's like, uh, if you're a, if you if you baptize people and your name's John, they'll call you John the Baptist. If if uh, uh, you're a carpenter and your 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 first name is Eric, they'll say Eric the carpenter. In fact, that's very very common for people to be uh, named. Their last name was their profession: Smith, carpenter, farmer. Um, Another thing that was uh, common for last names was was to be say J John uh, Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. Uh, so you, uh, they might say uh, your last name is your profession, 
your last name could be your relationship, your, your parental name, identifying that you're the son of so-and-so. Uh, and then also another way they came up with last names was uh, the city you're from, Jesus of Nazareth. So uh, in this case, it's John the Baptist that we're referring to in verse 6. So let's read that one more time with that thought in mind. And so it says, verse 6, there was a man, John the Baptist, sent from God, whose name was John. Okay, um, I'll go to verse 7 unless you want to co comment further on that, brother. Uh, go right ahead. But uh, uh, was sent from God. That stood out to me. And that's very... Uh, uh, impressive to me. Okay, back to you. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you said that. Uh, that's something we should not pass over lightly. Uh, that uh, we're going to learn more about this John the Baptist as we go through these uh, first few chapters of the book of John. He's also discussed in, in some of the other gospel accounts. Uh, I'm not sure about every one of them, but probably John the Baptist is, is mentioned in all of them. Uh, but, yeah, it is important to know that this is a person who's sent from God. He is truly a prophet, and it is established uh, even in his mother's womb. It, people, uh, it, it, we were told that this is, uh, he's a prophet even from his mother's womb. Uh, and, and also, uh, he's a prophet that was prophesied. Uh, Old Testament prophet uh, prophets talked about John the Baptist coming and uh, Jesus identifies him as Elijah. Uh, we'll get to that as we go along though. But yeah, so it is important to understand that this John the Baptist is truly a prophet who sent from God uh, to do a mission. And when God has a prophet do a mission, he fills them with the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the distinctions I think I made maybe last time or in a recent video is that uh, there's a, uh, we today who are uh, believers who are born again uh, because of our faith in Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit living in us permanently. We're baptized in the Spirit, indwelled with the Spirit, sealed with the Spirit. But, but in Old Testament times before Pentecost, uh, everything before then, the prophets, they would be filled with the Holy Spirit to do a, do a work, to, to go on a mission, to, to have power to do miracles and to prophecy. But uh, they, they didn't have the Holy Spirit living in them permanently the way that believers do today. Um, anything else before I go to the next verse, brother? Uh, brother Luke, I'd just like to point out that a lot of people, uh, professing Christians, are claiming John's office nowadays but the truth is as a born-again believer we all have a greater calling than John the Baptist had okay back to you brother Luke <laughs> yes okay we'll learn a lot more of that about that as we go along too okay we'll go now to verse 7 it says the same came for a witness now, that means the same, that's the same person we were talking about in the previous verse, this John the Baptist. Uh, so it says, John the Baptist came as a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now, in this case, I'm not sure on the last phrase, it says, okay, it says that same came for a witness, and John the Baptist is the witness, to bear witness of the light now, it's clear that the light referred here, it's uh, in KJV, it's a capital L. And when they, when they capitalize a word like that, it would, it would identify that this is reference to God. Jesus is, is this light. Uh, so John is a witness to, to be a witness to, for the light. And the light will learn that this is Jesus. And it says that all men through him might believe. Now, when it says all, that all men through him might believe, um, I'm not really sure. I have to look at that in the Amplify and see what it says. But what's your take on verse 7, brother? Oh, well, that's astounding, Brother Lou. What it appears to be saying to me is that 
John the Baptist came to be a witness of the light so that all men will believe? Can you imagine that? That is a uh, universalist dream. Uh, the universalist being uh, those who believe that everybody gets saved. Okay, we pray that that will, would, would, would possibly happen, but uh, unfortunately we know that's not the case. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Yeah, yeah, when it says, to me the word all, uh, it, 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 uh, we're not, I'm not going to twist this like a, uh, like a Calvinist would and say all doesn't really mean all. I think in this verse, all really does mean all, that all men might believe, every single person, but when it says might believe, that means that it would be possible for all of them to believe. Might believe means God's made it possible for you. You might, you might not, but at least he's made it possible. So this verse is not telling us that all people will believe, like in uh, universalism. It's saying that uh, all men can believe. It's possible. Uh, all right, before we go on, anything to, I want to read it in Amplified here too. It says, uh, verse 7, this man came as a witness to testify about the light so that all men might believe in Christ, the light, through him. Okay, uh, so that doesn't elaborate uh, the way that I just did, but uh, it, it, I think it's made it very clear. But I think it is important to understand that the word all doesn't mean that, no, now we have to, everybody's going to believe. No, it just means that all people can believe it, it's possible. They, they might believe it's made possible. All right, brother, if you want to go, I want to go to the next verse, but what, anything else to add to that? Uh, just one more thing, brother Luke, the through him, the him would be identifying Jesus. Would it not? Uh, it appears that it, it could be uh, identifying John the Baptist. What are your thoughts on that? That, that was my original uh, confusion, and I thought maybe the Amplified might clarify it, but but um, I believe it says, th when it says through him, uh, I think that's referencing through John the Baptist, through his ministry. He's See, he is the first one to identify him. Uh, and the, the, when we learn more about John the Baptist as we go along, we're going to understand that he is the one that is to introduce Jesus to the world. And, and he not only introduced the people at that particular time and that particular geographical location, in that, not in that small sense, but he's introduced everybody to Jesus because in the scriptures, he's the first one to point to Jesus and say he's the one. That's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He pointed right at him. So... Uh, you know, I learned about Jesus through John the Baptist. He's the first one to tell me who, who he was. Um, anything else you want to add to that? Very well put, Brother Luke. Okay. All right. Thank you. Then uh, I'll go on now to the next verse. Um, I'm going to go have to go back to KJV here real quick here. Uh, King James. Okay, verse, uh, verse 8 says, He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So he is referencing John the Baptist again, saying John the Baptist is not the light, but John the Baptist was sent to bear witness, to tell us who that light is and point him out. That's that's what we were talking about earlier. Uh, John the Baptist is well, the one prophesied in the Old Testament, the, the one that would be, we're, we're, I think we're going to see the word coming up here some point pretty soon called, he was the forerunner. He was the one that would come before Jesus and introduce him. Uh, verse 8, what's your comment on that? Sounds good, Brother Luke. Let's carry on. All right, now we got verse uh, nine. That was the true light 
which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Uh, this is referring to Jesus. Jesus is the true light. Now, the light, as I said earlier, uh, light is the one that um, illuminates. Jesus called himself the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, I saw a plaque on someone's wall years ago, and uh, I didn't want to correct the person and to kind of crush them at that time. But, but someone had misconstrued a verse and i think it's john 14 6 when jesus said i am the way the truth and the life 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 everlasting life eternal i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me but on their plaque they had it written um uh i am the way the truth and the light now it is true that he's the light it says it right here, but that's not the way it's written in John 14, 6. Uh, so Jesus is the life. He is the life giver. He's the one that brought life into the world. He's the one that created everything, as we read in the first verses of the first, this first chapter. Uh, and so and he not only gave us life, but he get, offers us life everlasting. He offers us, after death, a resurrection to life everlasting. So he is life, but he's also the light. And the light to me is, I think I gave this example last time, is that a light illuminates and brings truth, brings knowledge and understanding. It's like I made the comparison of, you know, that saying, hey, I've seen the light. Uh, you get a revelation. All of a sudden, you get it. I saw the light. And so... That's why I think it refers to Jesus in this case. Jesus is that light. That so when we finally understand who he is and why we need him and what he's promised for us, the light, it's like seeing the light. Uh, that's, there's, I think there's a gospel song, something like, I've seen the light, I've seen the light. I don't know. I don't want to try to sing and spoil everybody's night. But <laughs> Okay, brother, what's your comment on that? Wow, very well put again, Brother Luke. And it sounds to me like that doctrine uh, completely adheres to scriptures. Okay, back to you. All right. Uh, now, uh, um, I want to look at that verse uh, 8 in the Amplified. Uh, I, I think it's pretty clear, but why not look at the Amplified and see if it amplifies it even, even further for us? Uh, verse 8 in the Amplified says, John was not the light, but came to testify about the light. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. It's not that hard to understand that verse. Um, okay, back to the KJV, we'll go to verse 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Uh, In other words, um, when Jesus, he illuminates, you know, his, his, he's, he's giving light to everybody, but not everybody's going to accept the light, accept the truth, accept the, the revelation. Because we're going to find later that Jesus says, when he's lifted up on the cross, in that manner, he will draw all men to himself. So he's drawing everybody. He's shining his light on everybody. There's no excuse. No excuse for anybody to not uh, understand about Jesus, believe in Jesus, and because he's certainly shining the light for you, and he's cer certainly uh, drawing you, wants to attract you to him so you can receive life everlasting. Uh, but as we're going to find in the next verse, unfortunately... In verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So the he he was in the world. That's that's referencing, of course, Jesus. He, he, he didn't just stay up in heaven. We're going to uh, 
we're going to see future a lot of verses coming up and john as we go continue through this that jesus will actually say that he came down from heaven and so uh he, he is he could have stayed in heaven but he chose to come down from heaven and be with us and live live with man and he said the reason he did that was he came he said do not think that i came to be served that's not why he came so we could all serve him and and he could be the master and the rabbi i'm okay yeah the the disciples and the apostles they tried to serve him and they and and uh um follow him but He's, that's not really the reason he came. He said, do not think I came to be served. That's not why I came. I came to serve. Now, he served in a lot of ways. He served as an example. He served as a teacher. He, he served in healing and feeding people. He served in so many ways. But the biggest service he gave us was his life. He said, do not think I came to be served, but to serve and most importantly, to give my life as a ransom for many. So he tells us the primary reason he came down from heaven. It says here in this verse here that he says that he was in the world. Well, what, why did he come into this world when he could have stayed in heaven? So that he could give his life as a ransom. That's how much he loves us. And it says, and the world was made by him. It said earlier, when we go back to the first few verses, is in verse 3, it says, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Uh, that's something I neglected to cover last time. I, I thought of it later that I think it's important to go back and mention that. Not only is it saying here that in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same was in the beginning with god it's identifying this word as god eternal uh and and then it says and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made now those last three words are very very important because that can destroy the uh, the position of a Jehovah's Witness, because they believe that Jesus was made. They don't believe he's eternal God Almighty, as it says here in these first few verses of one, ch chapter one here. They believe he's a creature that was created. He was the first thing God created, and then Jesus, created everything else but it says right here all things were made by jesus and without him was not anything made jesus made everything he, without him was not anything made that was made so uh if if jesus was made then it says without him was not anything made that was made so if jesus was made you couldn't have this verse here because this verse says nothing was made apart from what Jesus made. So if you're someone that believes God made Jesus, verse 3 tells you you're wrong. Nothing was, without Jesus, no, was not anything made that was made. I Did you follow that? It could be a little complicated the, the way I explained it, but you get the key, the most important point there. Oh, absolutely, Brother Luke, and uh, uh, that's a big problem we have nowadays with those uh, false gospel preaching institutions like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Catholics and so on and so forth. There's so many of them that people are just going along with uh, men's doctrines and they're not looking into the Bible for themselves to see what God has to say to them. And that is a major problem that has to be uh, resolved. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. 
Okay. Uh, let, let me move forward again to where I was earlier. Uh, it said, uh, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. So Jesus made the world. In fact, it said earlier, nothing was ever made that he didn't make. So Jesus made time, space, matter, the universe, dimensions, everything that was made, Jesus made it. And it says, and the world knew him not. Uh, I, when I, it says, and the world knew him not, uh, I think verse 11 should continue right on there. It says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Uh, when it says, came unto his own, it's a reference to his, um, the uh, Israelites. You see, it was prophecy that uh, there would be a, messa a Messiah, a Savior, a Christ come in the future. And God promised this to Abraham. And he said, this, the whole world will be blessed through his seed. And it says seed singular not plural, it doesn't say through his seeds. His seeds are Isaac, Jacob, Ju uh, uh, the 12 uh, children of, of uh, Isaac, Israel, uh, and then all their descendants. That, that Those are the seeds of Abraham, the seeds. But the seed singular is this one significant seed that was going to come out of uh, Abraham as a descendant. One person who would be a blessing to the whole world. And that's, uh, as we study more prophecies, we find out he was talking about this Messiah, Savior, the Christ. And so when it says that uh, he, he came to his own, but his own received him not, this is a, a statement that, he, yeah, he was born in, into a Jewish family, as, as the prophecy said he would. His descendant, he's a direct descendant from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, and so on. And all these, all these uh, people were listed in prophecies about the Messiah. He'd be in that family line. And all those prophecies were fulfilled. So he came through the family line that was prophesied, and he, he, he was in that community of people, which were his people, the Jewish people, the Israelites, and, and yet they did not receive him. As a whole, the first believers in Jesus, of course, were from were part of his people, but it was a tiny little percentage rather than all the whole nation of people. It was basically it started off with 11 people. His own mother and brothers were, I think, even were even confused uh, about who he was that, until he, that he was finally revealed completely who he was. Uh, but you had apostles he has some disciples and then after his death burial resurrection they they were left to start the church and and the the first believers were all came from that original community of israelites the jewish people but the vast majority of jewish people did not receive him as it says in this verse here it says it says uh he uh he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Um, well, there's another verse that comes to my mind. Uh, this is uh, something I used to be very confused about for many years. There's a verse that says, the first will be last, and the last will be first. And I think that that is a reference to what happened here. The first people to... Jesus to come to, for the most part, didn't accept and they rejected him. Then the last people, or the next people, the Gentiles, they accepted him. But the Jewish people will come to accept him later on, or at least a remnant, a remnant of them. Even today, there are some people, some people who are from this Jewish family line who have become believers. So uh, there are some. I'm going to, I'm going to, We'll look at that in the Amplify, but first, give me your reaction to those verses. Oh, wow, Brother Luke. Uh, they're coming to him now. I'll tell you what. 
They're coming in droves. God is making a highway for the remnant of his people. And the Jews are starting to realize uh, that uh, Jesus is their Messiah. And, uh, of course, uh, okay, back to you, Brother Luke. <laughs> Brother, are you barking at me? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, I'll read it in the Amplified. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 10. Now I'm going to start with verse 9. There it was, the true light, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light, which coming into the world enlightens everyone. He, Christ, was in the world, and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, that which belonged to him, his world, his creation, his possession. And those who were his own people, the Jewish nation, did not receive and welcome him. I think that was pretty well done by the Amplified. What do you say? Uh, yes, Brother Luke, I think you're absolutely right. Okay, let's go on now. I'll go back to the KJV and read some more here. Okay, now verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Uh, I, I think that verse, will, we'll discuss that by itself here, even though it's the following verses are very important to it also. But it says, but as many as received him, that's, this is kind of a whosoever verse. Whosoever believes in, 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 the, in the Son has life. Whosoever. And it says here, it phrases it, but as many as received him. That means that anybody, <coughs> excuse me, anyone who would receive him, accept him, believe in him. Uh, it, there's no exceptions. It says, but as many as received him, anybody who would receive him, receive him and his gift of salvation, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, I know we've talked about this before, but uh, when we believe in Jesus, we do become a son of God. But it's a different sense, brother. Can you uh, differentiate between you as a son of God and Jesus Christ as, as the only begotten son of God? Well, brother, look, the way I understand it is uh, we are adopted sons. We're raised from the dead and then adopted by God into the family of God through Jesus Christ. Okay, back to you. Yeah, yeah that's a very, very important. We're not sons uh, from our first birth. Our first birth, uh, we are not even, we can't even be called a child of God. I and mean, this is a very common, very common uh I guess I'll call it a heresy because it, it disagrees with Scripture. Now, not to be confused with a damnable heresy. A damnable heresy is you're wrong in a way that you end up in hell. Uh, but th there are there's a thousand other types of heresies where we can be wrong about something, and it's it doesn't it's different than what the Bible says, so therefore it's a heresy. But many people think, or the the world as a whole thinks, that every person ever born. Is a child of God? Aren't we all children of God? They say, "No, we're not. Uh, we're not children of God until we get born again. The, in the first birth, we are we are uh, just um, creatures. We're not really a child of God. We're just creatures. We're, we're created, but we were not born from above. So that's why we need to be born a second time. Because see, the first time you were born." 
first when I was first born, uh, we were born wrong. Our first birth was uh, like a birth defect. We were all born with a like a, a, a DNA problem, uh, an incurable terminal disease, uh, death, mortality, sin nature. Some people want to argue about the answer to this question. Does someone go to hell because of what they do or because of what they are? Um, and I believe it's because of what we are. We are born wrong, born with a defect, a sinful nature, a, a spirit that is not connected to God because in the, in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, it said they died that day, but they didn't physically die. They died spiritually. They had a connection with God in the beginning when he breathed into them life. And, but then when they sinned, the Holy Spirit broke away and could not have fellowship with them because of sin. And their spirit was left dead. And then when they had Cain and Abel and Seth, and then generation after generation, all of us leading up to Brother Luke, and Brother Eric, we were all born with this dead spirit. So um, we only become a child of God is when we put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit connects, we get regenerated, quickened, the Bible says, we quicken, we're brought to life spiritually. Jesus is going to say in chapter 3 here coming up that we are born from above. And, and that's the time we become a child of God. And now, if you're a man, you're a son of God. If you're a woman, you're a daughter of God in that respect. But we're not, a, I'm not a son of God equal in the same sense that Jesus is the son of God. Because Jesus is what never got born he didn't get born the, uh, well he got born in the in the from his mother's womb mary but he's existed eternally he didn't have to be born again spiritually because of a sin nature see uh, it says that uh, there was a prophecy that uh, um, maybe you can tell me correctly what this is it says there's a prophecy it's the very first prophecy in the bible and it says the uh, the seed of the woman uh, that the, the Satan will um, hurt the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman will crush the head of the of the serpent or the devil. I'm I'm just paraphrasing. I can't remember exactly, but it, it's the very first prophecy in the Bible, and 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 that's what happened on the cross. That see he was. He was the seed of a woman. He was there now. How can you be a seed of a woman? Because we know that the man in sexual reproduction, the man produces and contributes the seed. The woman doesn't have a seed. But and yet in this case, he's called the seed of a woman, and we know that she doesn't really have a seed. So there, there is no seed from man in order to create Jesus. And some people believe that. It's through man's seed that the dead spirit, the sin nature, is passed. And in Mary's case, it was an immaculate conception, a virgin birth. There was no sexual intercourse that created Jesus. So he did not have the seed of man pass on to him the sin nature. Uh, so... All that being said, I am not a son of God in the same sense that Jesus is a son of God. Jesus is eternal God Almighty, manifest in the flesh as the son of God. I have a playlist that I did just this last year that I, was really fascinating to me. Uh, it's a question that I've never heard before. I've, uh, like almost 30 years of Bible study, I never heard it until recently, and I studied it out and did a, a teaching on it. And the question is, is it eternal sonship or incarnational sonship? 
I hope you'll watch that vid, that that uh, series, because in other words, in in John chapter one, we see that it says in the beginning was the Word. It doesn't say in the beginning was the Son of God. It doesn't say in the beginning was Jesus. It says in the beginning was the Word. So if you, someone uh, thinks that there's um, incarnational sonship, they say that this son status in terms of the role Jesus plays as the son, the relationship between son and father, all of that came into being at the incarnation. And then another faction of people, probably a majority, they think that this sonship is eternal, that Jesus, that the Trinity always had father-son relationship. But in, in uh, John chapter one, verse one, it says in the beginning, it was the word. So I'm not going to try to prove that right now. You have to watch that uh, video playlist. It's very thorough. And then you can come to your own conclusion, whichever you go, way you go. Uh, it's not, doesn't matter to me. Uh, the, as long as we all agree that Jesus is eternal. He did not have a beginning. He's eternal. He's, he's always existed. Okay, uh, there's a lot there, but uh, that's getting back to that question that when it says the uh, we have the power to become the sons of God, brother. Uh, what do you say about all that? That's a mouthful, isn't it? Absolutely, brother Luke. And Scripture will bear that out, and that's not a difficult conclusion to come to for those who love God's word and study God's word. It's very obvious throughout all of scriptures. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at those same verses now in the Amplified and see how they phrase it. It might be interesting. Okay, so that was verse, uh, 12 uh, but to but to as many as did receive and welcome him he gave the right the authority the privilege to become children of God that is to those who believe in adhere to trust in and rely on his name okay that's something I, I forgot to cover at the very end of that verse which to me is really really important but i think that the way they phrase this is, is just beautifully stated it says that i read it again slowly uh, because the, the 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 words that are being used here in this translation uh, are critically important because a lot of people want to argue that believing uh doesn't they translate the word believe as surrender pick up your cross stop your sinning become a disciple follow serve but that's not what believing is Believing is to trust, to rely on. That those those are words that relate to believing. Uh, so I, I think that the way that uh, they phrase it here is, is beautiful. It says, verse twelve in the Amplified, but to as many as did receive and welcome him. That's Jesus. He, Jesus, gave the right. That's the authority and the privilege to become children of God. You see, you become a child of God when you welcome Jesus, when you believe in him, when you put your faith in him. That is, to those who believe in, and that means adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. Now, uh, that's why in my statement of faith, one of the things that I emphasize is that uh, Jesus is the object of my faith. Um, now, there's a lot of things uh, that... Uh, there, there are a lot of doctrines that are important to understand, but a lot of times people can get all these doctrinal things and these and they, they, they adhere to they adhere to creeds. And one of the best examples I can give you is that there's there's a, a creed that Paul recited, and, and a lot of people think that was a creed that was established that was common in the beginning of the church, and that is First Corinthians fifteen verse three and four. And he said in the gospel. He says that, that Christ died for our sins, was buried on the third day, raised from the dead. Now, that's all true. 
That's all important. That's all essential. If Jesus didn't die on that cross for our sins, we'd be lost. Uh, if he, if he uh, uh, wasn't raised from the dead, we'd be lost. He couldn't raise us from the dead if he's still dead. He, he, by raising himself from the dead, he showed he has, does have power to give us life everlasting. And he promises that he will resurrect us to life everlasting when we put our faith in him. So these facts are very, very true, very important to understand. It's, it's why we can be saved. But we get saved not by uh, making a mental ascent and saying, those are true facts. Jesus did die on the cross uh, for our sins, and he was buried and he raised from the dead. I can give you an example of 1.2 billion people that say, yes, that's all true. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and was raised from the dead. 1.2 billion people that will say, yes, that's true. They believe it. It's a fact. But they're not saved. They believe that, they, but they don't believe in it. They believe that it's a fact, but they're not believing in it for salvation. Uh, they're not, because they're, if you ask a Roman Catholic, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? I want everybody to do that right now. Just memorize this question. As a matter of fact, this is a question that I have on my Bible track. I, I post this along with my statement of faith on every one of my videos now. And you can copy this section, and it's called Bible Tract, print it, uh, uh, make copies of it, uh, distribute it. But it, the first thing it says, do you think you're going to go to heaven? Why? The Roman Catholics are going to answer the question, do I think I'm going to heaven? Well, I think I will. I might. I probably will. I hope I will. I don't know. i got my fingers crossed. I hope. Well, why? Why? Why should you go to heaven? Why would you go to heaven? Well, it's because I'm a good person. I, I, uh, I did, uh, you know, go to church all regularly, and I, I even got baptized. And I went to confession and communion. And I like candles too, I, you know. And I, I try to follow the commandments, be a good person. And I, I, I'm hoping it's it's good enough. That's that that's a Roman Catholic has faith in their own merit. They think, well, if I'm just good enough, God will let me into heaven. So even though they believe the facts of the gospel, they're not believing in the gospel to save them. They believe the facts are true, but they're not trusting in his death and his burial and his resurrection and his person. That's why I say the important thing is that we must make Jesus personally the object of our faith. My faith is in this person to save me. My faith is not in myself, not in my own ability to get to heaven through personal merit. My faith is in someone else, Jesus, my Savior God. I'm relying on him to get me there. Uh, so that's why when it says to all those who believe in his name, I think that believing in his name, believing in him as a person, and when you believe in his name, what does his name mean? His name means God saves. So when I believe in Jesus for salvation, I'm believing God saves. I believe in Jesus. He is God who saves. Okay, brother, what's your response to that? Very good, brother Luke. Uh, it's a shame that so many people are so puffed up with pride that they think that they can earn their own way to heaven. But that's not the gospel according to scriptures. The gospel according to scriptures is what we've been talking about for the last 25 minutes. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. I do love the way that the Amplify phrases it. I'll read it one more time. It's so beautiful. It says, uh, verse 12. But to as many as did receive and welcome him, Jesus, he, Jesus, gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. Now, going to verse 13, I'll go back to the KJV to look at it first. Verse 13 says, 
even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So that's what I was talking about earlier. I said it says when when to become a child of God, we have to become one. We're not born one naturally. We're not naturally. Every person who comes out of a mother's womb is not naturally a child of God. We need to become a child of God. As it said in verse 12, we become a child of God because of our faith in the name of Jesus. It says, which were it says, which were born not of blood. In other words, this is not a physical birth we're talking about, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. That's through man's efforts, but of God. Okay, verse 13, brother. Absolutely, brother Luke. We all must be born of God if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. And... Uh, for crying out loud, please, listener and viewer, repent of your dead works and believe the gospel. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, now, verse uh, 14, it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, now, when you read verse, a lot of times, um, when we want to teach people about the deity of Christ, we go to John chapter one, and when we look at verses, uh, one through, uh, one through, uh, one through three, one, two, three, and then we jump forward to 14. Uh, verses four through 13, it's very common just to jump over those. Now, you, I think everybody can understand how beautiful and important it is to understand all of it. But if we read verses one, two, three, we can understand why first 14 could very well uh, have uh, come as the fourth verse. So I'm, let me read it in that way. John 1, 1, 2, 3, and 14 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word, no, I'm sorry, I, mis, I misquoted it. I'll read it again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, so, uh, you see, when we when we read the first few verses and it doesn't say Jesus and it doesn't say the son of God anywhere, um, a person doesn't know at that point who it's necessarily referring to. The word, in the beginning was the word. Uh, but when we go down to verse 14, it tells us the word that it's talking about in the first three verses, it says, and the word was made flesh. The word became a man is what it's telling us. And it says, and I think uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, uh, uh, God was made flesh. Uh, 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 God, no, God was manifest in the flesh. Manifest. God was, uh, and, and that, that, that's the same kind of a statement here. It's the same, basically, this is just telling us, God became a man. And then we find out, as we read more and more, who this is that, that John the Baptist is, is, what, is talking about. He identifies as when he points to Jesus. And that's him. That's the one I've been talking about. That's, the, that's the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we find out that the Word, God, became a man. And that man 
is Jesus, who John the Baptist identifies as the Lamb of God, because a lamb in uh, Judaism, their religion is they would sacrifice a lamb. Is there was a symbolic sacrifice that showing that uh, the lamb was died for their sins. Uh, the lamb really didn't do them any good at all. It was just a symbolic thing that they didn't really understand. They didn't understand necessarily. They was pointing to a, a, a real death for our sins. And that would be Jesus Christ. Okay. Hi, Neo. Uh, we hey. have somebody else with us, huh? Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, Neil, you're coming just in time for the last three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's right. I'm glad you could join us. Um, all right, so we got finished with verse. Let me ask uh, Brother Eric here to comment on verse 14 now. Chapter 1, verse 14. Oh, Brother Luke, uh, I was just thinking about all those uh, folks that don't believe that Jesus is God. The Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, and a host of others. Now, if you don't believe that Jesus is God, you're siding with the devil and you're calling Jesus a bastard. So I uh, implore you to repent of this evil doctrine. Okay, back to you guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Brother Neil, uh, this is my second study on the book of John. Uh, a few days ago I did John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5. And today, tonight, we did verses 6 through 14. Uh, I'm sure you're really quite familiar with all of that. So let me give you a moment here just to say your impressions of that section of Scripture. Oh, wow. You give me way too much credit. <laughs> uh, John, what was it? I'm sorry, my microphone. I, my speaker cut out. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. One through fourteen. Okay. Uh, that's the one that has to do with. Okay, I got you. I'm looking. I'm sorry. I'm just. I'm. My my. I, my kid was sick today. I had to bring him to the hospital, but he's all right. Uh, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and beheld His glory, and the glory as of only the begotten Father, full of grace and truth. The King James Bible was, you know. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the Word. The Word was made flesh. The Word is Jesus. Yeah. Jesus has yeah. been since the beginning. Uh, brother, one of the things that I, uh, I've i said, not only uh, in the first video of this series, but I've said this for years. Uh, if, if someone said, the Bible is going to be destroyed, I'm, uh, you know, there's somebody who's got a plan and they're going to destroy every copy of the Bible. But you can save one of the books. But you have to pick one of them and you got to do it quickly. Which book, or, which book quickly do you need, can we save? I would immediately say, let's save the Gospel of John. Yeah. Right? The most important book in the Bible. And uh, for a lot of reasons, and I said this in the introduction to this book uh, study, and one is that this first a uh, few verses in the chapter 1, it tells us who Jesus is better than any section of the scriptures except for the first chapter of the first, uh, book of Hebrews. We learn of the deity of Christ. We learn that he is eternal, God Almighty. We, we, we learn that uh, he is the creator. He's created everything. And that we were learn that he became a man. He became flesh. Um, and, of course, also in John we learn that you know, the rest of the important things, that uh, he died for our sins, uh, he's raised from the dead, and all the, uh, all the, and the all you've got to do to receive eternal life is believe in him. The, says, the book of John says believe 99 times. It never once says repent. And people think repent means to, uh, to stop sinning. You better, you better change your mind about sin and stop sinning. That's what they think you got to do. But if that, was, if that was required for salvation, then why does the book of John neglect it? Uh, it? The book of John says that John says the reason he wrote the book is so that we can understand how to get eternal life by believing in Jesus as our Christ and Savior. And, and so that's the reason he wrote the book. 
And yet in that book, it only tells us believe, 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 believe 99 times. So uh, that's the importance. Uh, my opinion is that anybody who is not a believer and, and who is learnt, wants to learn about biblical Christianity, the place you start, and even if you become a believer, the first place you start in studying the scriptures is read the Gospel of John over and over again. I suggest you read it maybe 20 times before you even try to read anything else in the Bible. Read the Gospel of John 20 times, and then and then maybe you're ready to go look at the rest of it. Okay, uh, Brother Neil, uh, what's your comments on all that? Oh, nothing much. Uh, carry on. Uh, other than that, John do a lot, and I think... Uh, I typed in the side chat, isn't John closer to Jesus than most of the other people, like the, the disciples and apostles? And He's like closer uh, re uh, relation-wise to Jesus? Than... Well, I think that uh, it's, it's not hard to, to make that claim because, uh, first of all, uh, John is referred to as his beloved disciple. So, Jesus it differentiates between all of them and John. John is distinct in that way. He's the one that has the title as the, his beloved. And John is the only one that, that did not, did not um, um, desert him. John stayed there through, through, through the trial and through the crucifixion. John was there. None of the apostles were there. They were all hiding out in fear for their life. But John was was brave. He, you know, he he he, would, he knew just the same thing as everybody else that if they kill Jesus, maybe they're going to kill his disciples next. But he was right there at the cross. And John is the one that G, uh, Jesus said to Peter, uh, Peter, you someday you're going to be taken away in chains and you're going to. Uh, die this martyr's death, and Peter said, well, what about that apostle over there, referring to John, and uh, uh, Jesus says, well, what? it's none of your business what happens to him if he if he lives, I, I, it's the very end of this book, too, I forgot how it's phrased, but he, so John is the only one that doesn't die a martyr's death. Now, he was a martyr in the, in the sense that he, he was suffered a lot for Jesus. He was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos, I don't know for how long, but probably for years. And I'm sure he was persecuted and suffered, but he was not killed. And so for all those reasons, it is easy to think that, that he was um, um, somehow different than the other apostles. Now, there's the Paul, the Paul only us. They want to elevate the Apostle Paul above everybody else and say you can only get saved by learning from the Apostle Paul. And, and Paul was the first... Uh, 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 first one to get saved, the first member of the church. There's a re, watch my playlist. Paul onlyism debunked, and yeah. you'll find out how high all the Paul onlyism claims are false. But they elevate Paul, and I say no. Paul, John, Peter, Jesus, they all teach us the same thing that yeah. that you just need to believe in Jesus for your salvation, and uh, there's no discrepancy between them. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Uh, my father named my middle name Paul, so therefore I carried it down to my son, who also has the middle name Paul. But we're not Paul only, as you know what I'm saying. Actually, and Saint Tommy's on here too. Sometimes he's a nice guy. He's not a Paul only. He says, you know what I'm saying. I, I, he agrees with more stuff than just Paul. But Paul has has a strong standpoint to certain people. But that doesn't mean. You know, that, that's just the only one that they agree with most of the time. You can tell when you're talking about one of you, those people that you're talking about, when, it, when they're, they're Paul only, they just disagree with all other. It's kind of like talking to somebody that believes in the Gnostic Bibles almost, saying that the Book of Thomas is better than any of the other Bible, any of the scriptures. And I'm like, no, but anyway, sorry I'm rambling. I was just letting you know how I see it. Yeah. Well, that's... Uh... Uh, that's a, a subject that I could spend 10 hours talking about. I've done it already on a playlist. So if anybody wants to understand why uh, the people who say uh, Paul is our apostle, Paul is the only one that has the message for salvation, only focus on Paul's writings, Romans through Philemon. I think if you hear people saying stuff like that, I hope you go watch my playlist.
default on me is a default too, because all their claims are false. Hey, brother, and, you're cutting out a little bit. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, well, that's okay. Maybe it doesn't need to be said anymore. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's something else you can go look into my other playlist. But for now, uh, we'll pick up next time, uh, John chapter 1, verse 15. I'll let uh, Brother Eric say any final remarks here, and then we'll, we'll end up. I'm trying to keep these broadcasts uh, to one hour from 9 to 10 Pacific time. I, I'm sorry, from 7 to 8 Pacific time. And that would be 9 to 10 uh, Eastern time. And that way I'll try to do them five, six, seven days a week, but we'll limit them to an hour. So, Brother Eric, what's your final words? Thank you, Brother Luke. And uh, how is my volume uh, sounding okay on this end? Yeah, mine, uh, you sound great, yeah. Okay, uh, absolutely. Everything you and Neil just spoke of is right on the money. And uh, I guess we can look the other way with these Paul Onlyists for now, as long as they don't infringe on the gospel. What do you say? Yeah, yeah well, I, I say that they're saved, uh, and I love them, uh, but I don't like them trampling on Jesus, John, and Peter and saying that we, we can't get saved from anything they said. That's where I really have a, a real serious issue. They say you can't get saved from anything Jesus taught or John or Peter. So uh, they say you can only get saved by what Paul taught. All right, uh, that'll be it for tonight. Uh, join me every night uh, for an hour, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. I'll end the live broadcast, but I'd like to talk to Brother Neil a little longer since he joined us late. If, that, if you're available. Okay, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.